all the roadmaps that governments and, and regions like the EU have adopted are a clear first step in the right direction to recognize the role that renewable hydrogen has to play in the decarbonization, recognize that it is a complementary way to electricity to decarbonize those vectors, those energy usages that uh, we cannot uh, directly electrify with renewable electricity. And so this is a huge step and, you know, shedding some light into how things will evolve. But then we need to be more concrete and really from the policy target, design the policy tools. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Ana Barillas, head of Iberia at Aurora. My guest on the show today is Anna Keyes. Anna was recently appointed the Managing Director for Hydrogen at EDP, leading the company's strategy for the renewable hydrogen business. Anna, first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much, Anna. Prior to that, Anna was the Head of Energy Planning at EDP. In that role, Anna was responsible for supporting the Executive Board of Directors in the decision-making process, contributing to a long-term perspective of the energy sector and an integrated vision of the company across businesses, that is kind of renewables, conventional, electricity generation, retail and distribution, and also across geographies, mainly Europe, US and Brazil. Before joining EDP, Anna worked in the Directorate General for Research of the European Commission, in Brussels, supporting the development of the strategic research agenda in the field of energy. And prior to that, she was at the California Independent System Operator, or CAISO, providing strategic energy consultancy to the wholesale power market and grid operator in the state of California. Anna, thank you for joining me. I couldn't be happier to have you on this podcast. Thank you, Anna. It's my pleasure to be here with you today, sharing some thoughts. Thank you for the invitation. Anna, you've had a very impressive career so far, but I find your academic journey equally fascinating. So I thought we would start our conversation today with a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. So you have a PhD with distinction, I will add, in electrical engineering from Iowa State University. Before then, you also completed both a master's degree in economics and a master's degree in engineering from Iowa State. And that actually followed a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Porto. So unlike some of us who just stumbled upon the energy industry, it almost seems like you always knew what you wanted to do in your professional life. Is that the case? <laughs> well, I think I, I, I could say that I always knew that um, I really enjoy math. I really enjoy science. So I really enjoy all the exact um, uh, topics. Uh, and so engineering seemed like a good fit for me, I'm a very analytical and, and rational type of person with very strong, you know, problem solving skills. So the engineering felt very naturally. Uh, within engineering, the energy topic was more like, I would say, uh, um, for chance. And it turned out very, very well. I would say that uh, as studies evolved and um, and also with internship experience and all of that, it became more and more clear that I could really confront great challenges in the energy sector. You know, not just from the economic perspective, but also from the social and, and bigger perspective uh, in, in, in the world. Um, and so the relevance of the energy industry um, is really, really something that became more and more clear and, um, and it's really at the heart of the solutions for many great problems like climate change. And so I'm very grateful, grateful that, uh, that I chose this education and this professional career and now can really contribute in a very uh, active way to deliver on, uh, on, on bigger challenges. Amazing. 
the title of your uh, PhD thesis actually uh, struck me uh, a lot as well. It was titled uh, Interdependencies and Economic Efficiencies of an Integrated um, Energy System. And, you know, the coupling of energy sectors, say electricity and heat, um, has certainly become a subject of a lot of uh, interest, both in kind of academia and also in industry as of late. But that wasn't necessarily the case kind of 15 years ago. So how do you think the thinking on, on the value of integrating systems has evolved since you did your, your thesis? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a very interesting question because it was really 15 years ago. And at the time, uh, you know, the, the topic of integrated energy systems was not really um, at, at the spotlight and it was not understood as it is today. Um, in fact, my thesis was really a lot of modeling, you know, a lot of modeling effort. And, and the modeling was all about trying to put together and understanding the interdependencies um, of integrated energy systems. The model was about the US and so the different energy systems were like the coal, the natural gas, the electricity, all of them were um, optimized in a single uh, integrated model. And the traditional way uh, of really developing and operating each energy system in, in silos without you know, having this conscious awareness of the energy system, the system-wide implications, um, bring about inefficiencies, both technical and economic inefficiencies. And so my thesis was really about understanding those dynamics and trying to figure out how it could become more efficient if we had you know, a, a, a broader view of the energy system as a, an integrated um, play. It's interesting that uh, just recently the EU adopted a strategy for energy system integration and uh, recognizing that today's energy system is still built on several parallel and vertical energy value chains, uh, which prevent us from achieving greater efficiency, hence preventing us from achieving the decarbonization goals. I guess the decarbonization goals were not uh, you know, in the back of my mind when I was uh, working on my PhD, mm -hmm. it was more about economic efficiencies. Yes. But now it's clear that they are they, they're very interlinked. And only when we really coordinate and, and plan and operate the energy system as a whole, we can deliver on, um, on those greater efficiencies that we really need. That's brilliant. And I can't really think of a better way of consolidating kind of that knowledge and that passion. Uh, and that thinking really that then into the, your new role as a as a in, a in a business unit that's focused on green hydrogen, which is of course, you know, kind of the the integration of of electricity with uh, with other uses uh, and other energy vectors for for heat industry and and all sorts of other um, kind of things. So that's brilliant. Before we go into hydrogen, and and I will because it's a it's a very interesting topic I think to to all of our listeners and to the industry as a whole. Just wanted to touch a little bit on a couple of things that I just think are fascinating in, in the role of um, energy planning. So, you know, as I mentioned before, in your role as head of corporate energy planning at ADP, you're supporting the board with a kind of long term view of what is a very rapidly kind of changing sector. And the first question I had is kind of what has surprised you the most, do you think, in the last 14 years of working in kind of long term strategic planning? Is there anything that you know has come out of nowhere in, in a way? Uh, well, that's a, that's a tough question because I say that um, most people that are not familiar with the energy industry, uh, they might think that this is quite boring in terms of you know being a, a something that has always been there and people take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would say that the, the most interesting thing and the most uh, surprised thing is that is really recognizing on a day by day basis. Uh, we really come to realize how things change in a, in such a fast way. Um, not just not the technology changes, but really the, the, the energy and environmental policy that drives even the, the technology and drive behavior of all the agents in, in, the, in the society. So um, the, the regulatory framework around the, the market design, um, around the energy system as a whole, I think this is very exciting. Um, and, and, and this is really the opposite of something that is very stable and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and don't change. So I think this would be maybe the, the thing that surprises people the most in the energy sector. 
yeah just how fast paced it, it always is I guess mm-hmm. and how quickly things have have continued to change um and, and will continue to do so which brings me to my next question which is you know kind of we, we talked about all of these changes that are kind of constantly happening so what do you see as the biggest uncertainty in in defining kind of a long-term view on which you can make robust kind of decisions in 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 power or energy markets more generally uh, what do you think it's in in your mind the, the biggest unknown really it, this is making decisions robust decisions um, in this long-term perspective of, of the energy industry is really something very, very, very challenging. Um, the energy industry makes very expensive and, and capital incentive in intensive investment decisions facing a lot of unknowns. Yeah. Some known unknowns and unknown unknowns, of course. Um, and so we really have to, to prepare for that. I guess the the... the there are um, uncertainties related with the way the technology evolves. Of course, there are a lot of technology breakthroughs that uh, uh, oftentimes we we don't anticipate. Um, but I would say that uh, most uh, uh, uncertainties arrive from the way uh, public policies evolve, mm. uh, which then uh, define the regulatory um, framework around the, the markets, around the infrastructures, around the way the energy sector evolves. So I would say that energy environmental policies and then the tools, um, the, 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 the policy tools uh, that shape uh, the industry, uh, you know, from fiscal to tools, CO2 pricing, uh, um, the market design itself, you know, if it's uh, in the context of, uh, of the power system decarbonization, um, Really, a lot of things have to change to accommodate the, the new desires and the major goals of decarbonizing. Um, and so this brings about a lot of uncertainties um, in many aspects of the power industry. For instance, in, in power prices. <laughs> um, power prices, which are something so relevant to make investment yeah. decisions. Um, it's something that in most markets change um, on an hourly basis. And if you are going to make an investment decision based on the, a revenue stream that will change every hour for the next three decades or so, and changes in a way that you have no uh, way to manage, because um, if you are decarbonizing, if you are investing in renewable technologies, you're mainly investing in capital intensive technologies and have no way to, once you do the investment, it's all sunk cost, right? You have yes. no way to really influence um, the, the prices that you'll capture from the market. And you face a lot of uncertainties um, and most of them you can't really manage. Um, so I guess uh, those would be the, the, the main uncertainties I would, I would um, highlight from, from long-term planning. Yeah, the, the, the role of policy is quite fascinating, right? On the, on the one hand, I think, you know, it, it has a critical role in incentivizing investments in, in new areas and providing some clarity as to the direction of travel. But on the other hand, as you were saying before, because the energy changes so quickly and markets tend to react quicker than policy and regulation does. And sometimes it can become a almost a, a barrier uh, or a hurdle to to kind of efficient market. So it it is fascinating. I you know policymakers, regulators have their job cut out for them um, mm-hmm. in in kind of regulating energy markets. Absolutely. Um, so you know I, I kind of said that I wanted to talk a little bit about the the hydrogen uh, kind of business. Um, and obviously this is a kind of new exciting uh, area in 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 the energy sector. It's hugely interesting uh, as a topic and. Obviously, you'll be leading now the EDP's kind of business unit uh, on this. It's fair to say that there's a lot of hype uh, around this, uh, but a lot of things I think still have to fall into place in order for hydrogen to to be to take the scale and get to the scale that it really needs uh, to make a significant impact. And again, the role of policy is probably important on on this regard. So with, with that in mind, I guess, what do you see as the key milestones in the adoption of hydrogen as a mainstream fuel in Europe? Well, I, I would say that um, before going to the key, key milestones, maybe uh, a, a, an 
a word on the key um, factors preventing the development of, of the hydrogen economy. And I would Perfect. say that really the key um, question today is competitiveness or the lack of competitiveness that renewable hydrogen has today. So this is really the main factor preventing mm -hmm. it to, to, to develop and, and to be um, adopted. And so we, we truly recognize the electricity um, costs represent a big part, half of the costs of hydrogen produ production. Um, and we do recognize electricity costs are coming down from renewables are coming down very fast, but this is not enough to, to put us on track to achieve the co cost competitiveness for renewable hydrogen. So we really need a comprehensive um, policy to support the scale up of, of hydrogen and ensure that costs get down uh, with scale. And so this comprehensive policy, you know, from, from financing and, and funding in instruments to uh, regulatory and, um, and other, type of, uh, other type of tools. So really the first thing that, that, that we need to, to do is to create a market. So I guess that, you know, all the, the roadmaps uh, that um, governments and, and regions like the EU have, have adopted are a clear first step in the right direction to recognize the role that renewable hydrogen has to play in the decarbonization, recognize that it, it is a complementary way to electricity to decarbonize those vectors, those, those energy usages that uh, we cannot uh, directly uh, electrify with renewable electricity. And so this is a huge step and, you know, shedding some light into how um, things will evolve. But then we need to be more concrete and really from the policy target, design the policy tools. Mm. And so to create that market, we need to have certainty on demand to scale up. Uh, so we need to really prioritize the use cases where hydrogen uh, is more uh, promising, you know, those use cases where you can reduce the most carbon and where you, you, you know for sure there are no alternatives, or at least today there are no alternatives more competitive and more efficient. And, and once you recognize and you prioritize those use cases, you should then promote um, the adoption of renewable hydrogen in those particular sectors by you know, defining probably you know, more stringent um, uh, decarbonization standards or decarbonization targets for particular sectors, uh, promoting uh, the acquisition of equipment or, or uh, the conversion of industrial process to really adopt hydrogen. And all of that you know, on, on, uh, on the basis of a comprehensive fiscal reform with the polluting pay principle uh, in, in yeah. the you know, with a, a very clear CO2 price signal, um, a very clear, um, uh, also a carbon border adjustment uh, policy in place to make sure that uh, um, everything is on a level, level playing field. So we really need to create that market from the demand side. And then, of course, from the production side, uh, we also need to, to do a lot on uh, um, having a clear taxonomy to recognize that uh, you know renewable hydrogen is the the way to go. Support the capex and uh, and recognize also that um, hydrogen has a lot of benefits and interplays also with the the power sector itself. So it can really um, also create a lot of value into. Um, facilitating the integration of renewables into providing flexibility and all that. But really to capture that value, you need to adapt uh, the, the, the market and adapt you know, the ancillary services, recognize that uh, it can be treated as, as a storage, F most likely you know, um, um, uh, promote the adoption by uh, uh, waiving some grid connection fees, in the, at least in the, mm -hmm. in the of, uh, of the, the adoption and other, uh, there are other instruments like <clears throat> carbon contracts for difference that uh, are being discussed to, 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 to promote uh, uh, long-term contracts and ensuring this long-term visibility that the sector needs to really evolve. Um, of course, then we have infrastructures that, that need to be, to be also uh, developed, not just storage, but also transport 
um, and all of that has to be in place. But bearing in mind, you know, that all this new uh, and comprehensive policy, like like I said in the beginning, needs to be designed um, in a fair way, <laughs> ensuring that uh, um, you know there are no disproportionately penalized consumers or, or other energy vectors, and also ensuring a very coordinated approach um, that national plans and national policies are coordinated with each other, are coordinated at the EU level. Uh, both in the way you develop the infrastructure and in the way you develop your regulation. So fertile, <laughs> fertile field to, to, to work on. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's what's, so that all sounds extremely kind of daunting and challenging and on, on many different levels. I think what's, what's really interesting hearing you kind of talk about it is that there, there have been a lot of success stories and kind of the, the policy framework to incentivize this sort of kind of new technology to a point where it does become competitive and it completely changes the landscape. And I think renewables is one example uh, that kind of went through a process of ensuring that there was clarity as to what the market was uh, for, for that renewable energy, whether that was through renewable obligations or kind of renewable standards. Um, you know, kind of making it very, very kind of clear that there was government support, also incentivizing it through revenue stabilization mechanisms like CFDs, plus a kind of carbon price. So all of these things, uh, you know, a lot of these things have been deployed successfully. This is definitely a more complicated sector in, in the sense that, as you say, it kind of links directly into industry, into transport, back into power, etc. But but a lot of the the building blocks, I think, are already there and have been tried and tested quite successfully in many, in many cases. Exactly. And, and, uh, and that experience, of course, we, we have to leverage upon that experience and, uh, and, um, and, and take advantage of the lessons learned. Definitely. Absolutely. So um, in terms of kind of Iberia, and, and obviously, you know, that's a core market for, for ADP. The Iberian market is seen as a potential kind of hub for green hydrogen. Uh, I think that's that's everywhere that you read about kind of hydrogen in Europe. That's the that's the label almost that's put on the on the Iberian market. Do you see that materializing? Do you think Iberia will become a hub for for green hydrogen? I think there's a rationale behind that. You know, even even today, you can easily understand that uh, the the production costs of renewable hydrogen in Iberia. Um, are significantly lower, can be significantly lower than in other parts of Europe, especially in Northern Europe, um, mainly because of the renewable resources, the renewable availability in, in Iberia. And, um, and this cost competitiveness of renewable hydrogen against the conventional, um, conventional alternatives, uh, it's something that it's expected to, to be rich um, earlier in Iberia than in other, other markets in Europe. In addition, Iberia also has um, very good infrastructures in terms of gas infrastructures, uh, ports um, that also put us on a, on a very good position to, um, to, to, to understand the potential of becoming really a hub. So depending really on the, on the, on the transportation alternatives for, for renewable hydrogen, you know, being it ammonia or liquefied hydrogen or other alternatives, Iberian uh, green hydrogen could, could be competitive uh, with locally produced hydrogen in some Northern European countries. Um, and, and even if that's not um, the main driver for placing Iberia as, as a hub for exports, I would say that it would be um, the way to go simply because there are not enough resources locally uh, in, in these other markets to ensure that you would be self-sufficient. Uh, so the international trade is likely to occur. Um, simply because of uh, physical restrictions and even promoted by cost competitiveness. So I think both um, factors will uh, support um, the, the reality of Iberian becoming a, a hub in renewable hydrogen going forward, yes. That makes sense. And, and you know, there's a political, I guess, appeal 
uh, of, you know, kind of security of supply in, of the whole energy kind of system for Iberia as well. So the, the thing that Iberia has abundant resources of is renewables. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have gas, uh, it doesn't have oil, but re renewables are abundant. And, and there's a lot of interest in the market of, of exploiting those resources, I guess. So that the nexus, again, kind of makes sense between, between those two things. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And one last question, um, and I have a lot more, but I'm conscious of time. Um, so how do you see the, the role of, um, or, or the interplay, I guess, between kind of hydrogen and batteries evolving? So we've talked a couple of times about the, um, the relationship between hydrogen and the um, power sector, and the fact that it can help integrate renewables in, into the grid. That's a little bit of, of what's expected of, of batteries, I guess. So over time, for example, do you think there will be less need for long duration batteries if hydrogen takes off? Or what do you see as an interplay, if any, between green hydrogen and batteries in, in the Iberian market going forward? Hmm. That's, a, that's a tough question to answer. It comes back to the, the, your initial questions on uncertainty going forward and the long term uncertainties. But I'll say that um, the way I see it today is that they're complementary um, and there will be room for both types of technologies. But if, if, if we go, for instance, in the mobility sector, I would say that uh, batteries have a, a clear cost advantage over, um, <laughs> over hydrogen uh, for most, uh, you know, the, the, for the, the, the mobility usages that we have um, uh, with, the, with light duty vehicles. But for, for long range and heavy duty vehicles, uh, we can easily recognize some limitations of, of batteries. And so in that space, uh, fuel cells will probably have advantages over batteries. Um, so on that, on transportation, you see, I, I, at this point in time, I believe that they will coexist and, um, and, um, and each one directed to a particular segment of the transportation or the mobility sector. For stationary usages, batteries are already, you know, a, a proven technology and much more efficient than hydrogen, much more efficient than hydrogen. So I would say that hydrogen will be concentrated, it will be a, a very suitable uh, technology to decarbonize uh, those usages where you you cannot electrify, and also as a, a, to decarbonize a, as a, as a feedstock in the, the applications where hydrogen is a feedstock. But like you said, the hydrogen also has an interplay with the energy sector, and it can wor uh, work as as an energy storage um, um, in, in in a number of ways. So I guess um, batteries. Um, they are recognized for having a very fast response and quickly um, putting out a lot of power, but they have limitations in terms of they ab their ability to store a lot of energy and to store, store a lot of energy for a long period of time. Um, and so in that space, uh, hydrogen can also um, perform much better than, than batteries. So again, another complementary uh, function of the of the hydrogen as the stationary storage of, of energy. Brilliant. And we can probably talk for hours on a number of topics and I'm sorry we can't keep talking. Um, perhaps next time actually we can also talk about other things that we didn't even attempt to cover uh, today. There's many other kind of energy topics. There's other you know, topics around kind of women in leadership, motherhood and a successful career and women in energy, of course, which I think a lot of our listeners would also be interested in. But for now, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me and share your views with our listeners. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. That was Anna Barias, head of Iberia at Aurora, speaking to Anna Kayas, Managing Director for Hydrogen at EDP. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.